be here today. Can you guys hear me? I always have to adjust the microphone down when I'm speaking. So um, I really respect the work that Slow Food San Francisco has done and the perspective that they take on the obesity epidemic. Because today we're gonna hear a lot of talks and a lot of people discussing the fact that pediatric obesity and obesity in general is not as simple as people taking in more energy than they're putting out. And I think that was a very old biomedical model and it does not work. Today's speakers and panels are all gonna highlight the various ways that our environment determines our health and the health of our children. Today, I'm gonna to be discussing the intersection of multiple exposures that are common to obesity and puberty. We all know that obesity is multifactorial, and what we're discovering is that it's mediated through puberty and vice versa. So my talk today is specifically about how our modern environment impacts the hormonal health of our children and their risk for puberty, their risk for obesity is mediated through puberty. And when I use the word environment, I hope you're going to learn that I don't just mean chemicals. So when I graduated medical school, the speaker at my medical school graduation said, half of what you learned is wrong, we just don't know which 50%. So when I was in training, the, uh, the dogma was that girls should not start having any signs of pubertal development prior to age eight, and that they, menstruation prior to age 10 was abnormal. And that for boys, that was at age nine. Before I get into more discussion about how this is incorrect. I want to make sure that this audience understands the con some of the concepts that are poorly understood. And there are a lot of misconceptions about puberty, specifically in girls. Puberty is not first period. It is not a single event, but a series of changes that takes place over two to three years, maybe a little less for some girls, maybe a little more, and that's part of the research that I'm participating in. For girls, puberty is primarily two events. The most important one to signal the onset of pubertal development is called thelarchy, or breast budding, breast development. Another one is puberty, which is pubic hair development. Puberty is not stinky armpits and body hair under your arms. We call that adrenarchy because it sounds better than stinky armpits. <laughs> puberty in girls is not menarchy or first period. That is a very late event, sort of signaling the end of the process of puberty. And I think this is a misconception because when I have been in the media and I've been interviewed, and I say puberty is starting as early as seven in some girls, the public think we're saying people are getting their periods at seven, which is really not the truth. And I'm gonna go through the data here so that you can understand that. The pubertal transition is, is a very long period, and the timing and the tempo and the sequences of these events can vary. Some of these changes are not visible. So the first sign of puberty is that some of the hormones from your pituitary are getting secreted overnight. There's nothing that can show that unless you get overnight blood tests. Some of the other signs of puberty are very visible, especially in girls, specifically breast development, but in both kids, growth spurts. And Funnily enough, this is another one, your feet get bigger. That can be one of the first signs of puberty. For anybody with teenage kids, you start buying many more shoes, that may be a sign. And the problem is that the onset is tricky to define in research. So there hadn't been a lot of research done epidemiologically since James Tanner did his research in an orphanage in post-World War II England. And we all know that's not very generalizable because of the nutritional and social deprivation some of those kids went through. So when I was in the end of my pediatrics training, a very large influential study was published, which we call the Crohn's study, although there's many Crohn's studies. This is the one in endocrinology we all focus on. But Crohn's stands for Pediatric Research in the Office Setting, and it's, it's an ongoing consortium of primary care pediatricians who do research. One of their first large papers was published with, with Marsha Herman Giddens as the first author in 1997. And for any pediatricians in the audience, you probably all know this, you know this as well as I do, because this was a very influential paper. This was a cross-sectional analysis of 17,000 girls, one seven, 17,000 girls, of whom 90% were white, and I'm gonna get back to that. And this paper was the first one to really capture the earlier onset of puberty in girls. And what this paper found was that on average, African-American girls were having breast development at age 8.9 years. 
And in fact, by age eight, 50% were having breast development. For the Caucasian girls, it was closer to age 10. But at age eight, 15% of those Caucasian girls had breast development. And you remember the first couple slides, I said we were taught that age eight was the cutoff for normal? Well, you can't call something normal if 50% of a population is having it, or 15% of another population. So this paper was very influential because it highlighted the earlier onset of puberty in girls, but it also highlighted some differences by ethnicity. Unfortunately, it was literally black and white. These were African-American girls and Caucasian girls, and nobody else was in the study, and it was primarily Caucasian girls. There were a lot of criticisms about this study, and in pediatric endocrinology, a lot of the old-timers actually didn't accept this data. They said, this is cross-sectional. These were girls who were in for chief complaints of tummy aches. Maybe all the early puberty girls are going in for tummy aches because they're somaticizing and they're having other issues, and I'm going to talk about why that may be valid. So in this context, in 2001, the NIH put out a call for a research project that um, I was able to be part of, and it was actually in 2001, not 2007, that Julie and I started working together. And this was a breast cancer study. And I think as my talk unfolds, you'll understand why this was a breast cancer study. But this is studying the intersection of common exposures, which may be leading to breast cancer, as well as early puberty. And it was a consortium of basic scientists, epidemiologists, and community advocates, each with our own project. And I was part of the epidemiology project. And it was a longitudinal study where we recruited 1,200 girls and studied them. And they were in three sites. Our girls were in San Francisco. They were Kaiser Bay Area members who were born at Kaiser, girls who were recruited at age six to eight, Kaiser San Francisco, San Rafael, and Oakland. We also had girls who recruited out of Ohio, out of the Ohio public and Catholic school system, as well as the Children's Hospital there. And then we had girls recruited out of Mount Sinai School of Medicine in their clinics in Spanish Harlem. And this was 1,200 girls that were aged six to eight at the time of recruitment, and we followed them. Uh, we just actually wrapped up, I think May 1st was the end of our funding, it may have been April 1st, but it's, it's over now. This is a very racially diverse group. We had representation that was much more reflective of the American population than the PRO study had been. We were able to have enough, a large enough group to analyze white non-Hispanic girls, African American girls, Hispanic girls, and Asian girls who are very, very understudied in this research. Asian American girls have not been studied, and um, our site at San Francisco had a, a large enough number of them that we were able to study them. It was interesting because Ohio mostly had African American and Caucasian girls. Mount Sinai had mostly um, Puerto Rican and Dominican girls. And in the first couple years, we were having arguments in our meetings about whether they were Hispanic or black. And that was a very eye-opening uh, discussion about ethnicity for me. But we were able to evaluate them and place them into these categories. And we found obvious ethnic differences, which we don't think are genetic. We think are related to underlying socioeconomic and exposure factors. And so this was our paper that came out in pediatrics in 2010. And it, this was the analysis at that point because the girls were still pretty young. But at that point, we found the following, which is pretty striking and is very consistent with the PROS data from 1997. We found that at age seven, 25% of black girls had breast development, 15% of Hispanic girls, 10% of white girls, and 2% of Asian girls. Remember, I told you that the dogma at this point had been that age eight was the cutoff. So this is really clearly showing that this phenomenon was true and real, and that there were these somewhat to me disturbing differences between our ethnic groups. As time went on, we were able to get the average age as the girls got older and all of them went through puberty, because we were still looking at a wide range of pubertal development. And some girls were not developing breasts until age 12. And what we found overall was remarkably similar to the PROS data from that cross-sectional study. And what we found was that African-American girls on average developed breasts at age 8.8 years, Hispanic girls were nine and a quarter, and Asian and white girls were nine and three quarters. This was pretty phenomenal data to have, and I really, again, like that we were able to include our Asian girls and separate out the Hispanic girls. The rates for pubic hair development were Similar, and again, if you look, tease out the data, somewhat disturbing. At age seven, 20% of our black girls had pubic hair development. 
6% of white and Asian girls, Hispanic girls, and 2% of Asian girls. And it's always, I, I, my children were younger than this cohort of girls, and so I would look at this data and sort of think about it in a very scientific way. But when this paper was published in 2013, my daughter was seven. And I suddenly started looking at this and thinking, 20% of girls her age in the African American community have pubic hair development? This is crazy. And so I, it's really interesting, and I, I've talked about this a lot now, when I put on my mom hat versus my scientist hat, I come up with a very different emotional response. So our data is currently being analyzed for age of first period. We don't have that, but I want to present that to you just to contextualize this. We still think that age of periods has not shortened. So the M. Haynes data showed that African American girls on average were 12-ish when they got their first period. Mexican Americans specifically, because we had to use the Mexican M. Haynes data, were 12 and a quarter. And non-Latino whites were 12 and a half. The pros data was similar, a little bit older, with 12.2 for African American girls and 12.9 for the Caucasian girls. So this is all nice and scientific, but why does it matter? Well, there are serious consequences, both short-term and long-term, for kids that go through puberty early. And I'm going to focus here specifically on girls. But there's a long list of psychological outcomes that can be really damaging. So girls who go through puberty early, specifically marking it with first period, and that's just because, if you remember at the beginning, I said puberty is really hard to study. When you're going to study the onset of breast budding, you have to have girls examined physically and touched by a trained research associate. And those are very hard studies to do. So most of these data are done by recalled or at the time of first period, girls stating when they got the first period. So when we talk about consequences, we're really focusing on the, the data that comes from age of onset of first period. But again, that's just because that's an easier marker to study rather than trying to study true breast budding, which is a challenge to study. And what we see is that the earlier girls are when they get their first period, the higher rates of depression and anxiety, general behavior problems or delinquency, including poor school attendance, they're more likely to be overweight as a consequence of their early puberty. Remember that, because I'm going to get back to that. They're more likely to use substances, including tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana, as the main ones that have been studied right now. They have earlier initiation of first sexual intercourse and earlier first pregnancy. And then they're at a higher risk of body image disorder, eating disorders specifically. So that's kind of your basic teenage nightmare, right? <laughs> right there? Sort of the things we don't want to have happen to our teenage girls. And what's disturbing is that these outcomes are already more prevalent in our African American and Latina youth. And those are the girls that are already predisposed to going through puberty. So this is kind of a combination that can lead to really poor outcomes for a significant portion of our community. But it lasts longer than just adolescence. As an adult, the earlier you are when you get your first period, the higher, you, the higher rate you are to die young. In fact, puberty can be related to all-cause mortality, mediated through a number of things. And I feel like every month there's a new piece of data that comes out about this. So we know that girls who get their periods before age 11 have a much higher risk of breast cancer than girls who get their periods after age 13. That risk of depression and substance use lasts, persists into adulthood. And so do other reproductive cancers besides breast cancer. It looks like perhaps uterine and cervical cancer, although it's interesting because the cervical cancer may be mediated by the earlier sexual um, activity because that's an HPV-associated cancer. Um, again, adult overweight and obesity is related to earlier menarche, even if you weren't overweight at that time. And poor cardiovascular health. health. And in fact, there was a, a journal of circulation that came out looking at cardiovascular health. These are adult cardiologists. This is their journal. And they said, the paper was, is it all related to puberty? These are kind of depressing things, but it's not inevitable. And I think it's really important that we go back and look at the culprits and see what we can do to help people reduce these issues, these, these uh, consequences. So what are the main culprits? And there are three main culprits that I'll be discussing today that are related to the earlier onset of puberty, but also are probably related to those, all of those both psychological and physical core outcomes. And the three main culprits are obesity, 
environmentally disrupting chemicals, and toxic stress. And we have to remember that puberty is a window of susceptibility, a WOS. It's a very popular term in environmental health at the moment. And what a window of susceptibility is, is a time of great growth or susceptibility to changes in probably cellular makeup. So when cells are rapidly dividing, they are at a higher risk for any kind of exposure or genetic or epigenetic change as the cells are dividing. So you can think of various times in a person's life that they might be at highest risk. One would be in utero when they're, when they're developing fetus. The other would be at that time of rapid neonatal growth in that first year of life. Then childhood growth kind of slows off a little until it peaks again during puberty. And obviously, if you're developing breast tissue during puberty, that could be a window of susceptibility to specifically agents that are active on the breast. And for women, the window of susceptibility then extends to when they are pregnant and their breasts are then growing and nursing. So when we think about that, puberty is a really important example of a window of susceptibility because of all the different things that could be active and possibly affecting you. One of the challenges of this field is that there's, it's impossible to isolate any of these things and examine them as a single factor. It's really a synergy of exposures, and there are multiple exposures that can affect puberty and health, and maternal and psychosocial factors also influence puberty, and it's the intersection of the chemicals and stress. And I'm highlighting two particular studies here. Um, the b -SERP study, which is the one that I have been a part of, and then there's a great study, if anybody wants to get more information, um, and I can talk a little bit more about it. I'm only personally involved as a, as a consultant called Chamacos, which is looking at the um, children of farm workers in Salinas, and as you can imagine, they are at very high risk because of the population in Salinas, which is both socially deprived, violent, and their parents are working in the fields with pesticides. So, um, so this research that I'll be presenting is, um, research from collaborators over many studies, and I'm just one of many people who is sort of representing the group. I'm gonna talk about obesity as the first main culprit in early puberty. So now we're talking about obesity as a predictor, not as a consequence. I think a lot of people today are gonna to talk about obesity as a consequence. So what we found in our local study, looking at girls, is that those who had lower body mass index, BMI, had later rates of breast development. So this is a study looking kind of cross-sectionally at our girls, starting at age seven and going up to age 11. And the blue bars are girls who are under the 85th percentile BMI, or considered to be a healthy range. The orange are the at-risk or overweight girls, 85th to 95th percentile BMI. And the green bars are greater than 95th percentile BMI. And I hope everyone in this audience understands BMI charts and what that means. But in case you don't, the 95th percentile BMI is the cutoff for obesity, which is equivalent to an adult BMI of 30. The 85th percentile BMI is equivalent roughly to an adult BMI of 25. So I call the 85th to 95th percentile kind of the chubby kids, and the over the 95th, the green bar here is the overweight kids. And what you can see, this is a smaller end, but what you can see is that at all ages, the blue bar, the non-overweight kids, were later developers. Because of our end being small in this subset, the, it sort of switches back and forth. But wh whether you're really overweight, obese, or overweight, you have a higher rate of breast development. And this was not just because you had pudgy fat tissue on your chest. This was actually breast development because our research associates had the girls disrobe and actually palpated their breasts. So we can look at this data in another way in the larger study. This is uh, from the 2013 paper looking at the whole 1,200 girls. This here, it blue line is that pediatric research in the office setting study that I told you about by Marshall Hernan Giddens, 1997 girls. Those were girls whose birth years were in the um, 70s and 80s. This cohort here are girls whose birth years were in the mid 90s. So we have a 15 to 20 or so year difference in the cohorts here. And I just remember that. Overall, this dotted line here, this is for our white girls. This is the age, the amount of girls that have breast development at any age. And we started back at five, but some of the girls were recruited a little earlier. And this is age 11. And going up here, 10, 20, 30. I don't know how well you can see in the back of the room. And what you see is this orange dotted line here is that at every single age, even the girls that were in the general population, 
all were going through puberty at an earlier age than the girls in the paper published 14 years before. So at age seven, roughly 10% of our girls had breast development. And it was about, if you look at this again, the general population, it had been lower in the Honey Gibbons paper at every stage. If we separate out the obese girls, you can see that the girls whose BMIs are high, above the 85th percentile, actually, I should say overweight, are much earlier the whole way along. So every step of the way, this green line represents the overweight girls, and they're starting puberty significantly earlier. And you can't really, you shouldn't really extrapolate from this. Some people in the press said, oh, they're just starting two years earlier. It's not quite like that when you look at the data, but it's significantly earlier. And what's interesting is when you take out the girls who aren't obese, they're still, this line here, they're still going through puberty earlier than the Herman Gibbons paper, which came out 14 years before. So what does that mean? It means that all of our girls are going through puberty earlier than the population that was only 20 years older than them, as marked by breast onset. The overweight girls are going through much earlier, but even the non-overweight girls, for the Caucasian girls, are going through. So this means that the, a lot of the effect is from obesity, but not all of the effect. So what is the rest of it? A little bit disturbing is that in, this is in our black girls, so the same exact uh, paper, the same exact uh, representation here, but these are in our black girls. The blue line here is the pro study. The dashed line that overlies is the non-overweight black girls. Overall, our black girls were going through puberty earlier, and the obese or overweight black girls were going through earlier. But what's interesting is the non-overweight were at the same sort of rate as the pro study. And what some of us speculate about is that the, if obesity is the main cause, but there's other exposures, that maybe the African American girls were already exposed to those exposures in the pro study, and that's why they were already going through puberty earlier. So, what is the connection between obesity and puberty? Unfortunately, I hope all of you in the back can see this study. I'm going to walk you through it because it is kind of a complicated study, but a, a slide, but I think it's a really important one. This bar here and all these other bars represent EDCs, or endocrine disrupting chemicals, which I'm going to be speaking about a little bit more later. When we think about obesity here, we used to think of obesity or visceral fat as just inert substance that doesn't do there, it just kind of it isn't necessarily what you want it to be or where you want it to be, but it doesn't do anything. And now we understand that fat tissue is very metabolically active. So we, what causes obesity? Well, we know it's energy balance, and I think that used to be the old-fashioned view that it was just energy balance. So you eat more, you exercise less, you gain weight. But we know that that's just too simplistic. We know that there are prenatal growth factors. So for example, mothers who had diabetes when they were pregnant are more likely to have children that grow up to be overweight, even when they control for body weight at birth, even when their children are at a healthy weight at birth. So there's something about maternal BMI, maternal diabetes, and what's happening in the Indian environment that can make two kids with the exact same energy have different outcomes. We also know that the environment triggers obesity, whether it's your built environment or your social environment, and we're going to be, a lot of people today are going to be talking about that. Endocrine disrupting chemicals can cause the obesity. They can also act on existing fat tissue to have metabolic effects that are differential. Fat tissue has a lot of effects on organs all over the body the ovaries, the adrenals, the liver, and the fat. So fat cells themselves mediate each other, and the more fat you have, the more of these hormones, aromatase, leptin, and adipokines, amongst many others, are secreted. Leptin is one of the hormones that preserves body weight, so it mediates food intake, and it prevents you from losing weight, essentially. Aromatase goes and acts and makes estrogen. It turns your testosterone into estrogen, which isn't such a great thing if you're a seven-year-old girl. You don't really want a lot of estrogen. Your liver changes a hormone which carries the estrogen around, decreasing it. So the obesity goes to your liver and decreases, if you want to think about the carrier protein or the boat that carries the estrogen around. That frees the estrogen up to be more metabolically active. So your fat's making more estrogen and your liver's making it more readily available. The adrenal glands and the ovaries, when there is a too much excessive body fat, make too much androgens, which is the hormone responsible for pubic hair development. All of this together can then increase insulin resistance, which can feed back and make all this worse. This leads to a much higher level of your sex steroids, specifically the estrogens and the testosterones or androgens. The endocrine disrupting chemicals can then act in those and make those worse. 
And you end up with a promotion of earlier adrenarche, that's the body odor, pubarche, pubic hair, felarche, which is the most important one, and even true central precocious puberty, which is when girls and boys get the puberty much too early. So this is sort of a complex idea where obesity is both a result of and a cause of many metabolic reactive events that lead to earlier puberty. And a lot of these are mediated by these chemicals, these endocrine disrupting chemicals. So let's talk more about endocrine disrupting chemicals. An endocrine disrupting chemical, or an EDC, is a chemical or a compound, because some of them are natural. They're not all fabricated by biochemical labs. But they are compounds which mimic, in some way, a hormone in your body. But it can be very complex. I think everyone thinks of EDCs as causing things. But some EDCs may counteract hormones, and some may do both. So you may have hormones that can delay puberty, I mean, excuse me, chemicals that can delay puberty, can advance puberty, or they may work through other means in sort of mysterious ways. They can have very differential effects. And what's really relevant for this group, and what we're gonna be focusing on, is that there are specific EDCs that are known as obesogens. Obesogens are endocrine disrupting chemicals which can cause obesity, or can make obesity worse, specifically we think through mediating, mediated through insulin resistance. And I think some people might call, call high fructose corn syrup an obesogen, um, and that will be talked about a little bit more, I think, today. So the chemical exposures that have been studied, that we studied specifically in our study, uh, the research study, are these compounds. And this is where everyone starts looking at their water glasses or their water bottles, and I think we all have to take kind of a deep breath and know that while we can do our best to minimize exposures, none of us can ever eliminate these, unfortunately. So phthalates, what are phthalates? Phthalates are plasticizers, so they're in PVC, they're in vinyl floors, they're in toys, they're in shower curtains. And what's really concerning for girls in puberty, remember that window susceptibility, they're in cosmetics. And I always joke, I don't wear a lot of makeup, I just never have. I wore my most makeup when I was 13. I think I wore eyeshadow every day in eighth grade. So these girls that are in puberty are using a lot of these compounds and they're in that window of susceptibility and unfortunately they're exposed more because they have smaller skin to body ratios. And phthalates are in cosmetics, nail polish, shampoos, and lotions. And so it's ironic that the girls who are probably most vulnerable are also the ones that are going to be using it the most. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to explain what these are and then I'll talk about the effect. PBDEs are flame retardants or other, we also studied other persistent organic pollutants. One of the things we found, just uh, incidentally, is that we were comparing levels of these compounds in our girls, in girls in Ohio, and girls in New York. And all the girls had different levels, group by group, and there was a wide range, but the ranges were different. California girls have the highest rates of the chemicals that are in sunscreens, and that's not surprising. California girls have the highest rates of flame retardants. So this paper, we found this, and this, this was published about five years ago. I don't know if any of you know that up until two years ago, California had very, very strong flame retardant laws of furniture, and it was a conspiracy between the cigarette companies and the chemical companies, because cigarettes did not want to be made, they didn't want to make cigarettes safer. So the chemical companies said to the cigarette companies, hey, we'll make chemicals, but so you don't have to make your cigarettes more safe, and then we both win. We sell more chemicals, you sell more cigarettes. So they had this flame retardant law, and there were many pieces of evidence that were presented to the state legislature to show that we needed to get rid of this. It's prevent, it slows down the fire by like 10 seconds, it's negligible. One of the pieces of evidence was our study showing that we, our girls had much higher rates of flame retardants than the girls in Ohio and uh, New York. And now, you no longer have to have flame retardants as your means to prevent fire. You can use non-chemical means. And of course, what California does, the rest of the country does. So I like to think that we were a small piece of helping to make change. And um, now you can buy furniture, and not just, it used to be able to make sense of furniture from Europe that you could buy without flame retardants. Now everybody's pretty much manufacturing it. So this is really great. Cotinine is in cigarette smoke. That was uh, specifically studied because our girls who lived in Spanish Harlem had very high rates of exposure. Triclosan is really on its way out, but when we started the study 15 years ago, triclosan was in an ascendant phase. Triclosan is an antibacterial agent. It was in, and still is in, antibacterial soap. Not hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer is alcohol. This was, there are brands of soap that are liquid soap that say antibacterial. 
Triclosan is an estrogen mimicker. It's been banned in many more reasonable parts of the world than America. And um, it's now on its way out because I think there's been a lot of grassroots education saying that it's increasing antimicrobial resistance. Phenols and BPA, I think everyone's heard of BPA. Uh, BPA is a kind of scary one because BPA was invented as an estrogen. So back in the 50s and 60s, they were trying to get a birth control agent. BPA was a chemical, it was an estrogen. It was used pharmacologically, and it wasn't so great. Somebody figured out it was a plasticizer. I don't know the connection there, but it is now in hard plastics and can linings and all those bottles that used to not say BPA-free and now say BPA-free. Um, phenols in general are also organic pesticides and mothballs. is actually a phenol. Um, and then PFOA um, and phytoestrogens are an interesting one. So phytoestrogens are uh, found in natural products, including soy specifically. And so I'm going to start talking about the results on the next page. I didn't put this in a slide. But our data suggests that, um, and there's a lot of epidemiological data that suggests that intake of soy actually can, can be preventative and help delay puberty. And that's not commonly known. I think the popular media thinks that soy is causing early puberty. And I get that question. Is it the hormones in the milk, the antibiotics in the meat, or the soy? Those are my three top three questions I get asked. And we know that women who grew up in countries where they eat soy um, have a lower rate of breast cancer. And that that rate then rises when the next generation will be moved to a country where they eat less soy. So the question is, how is that mediated? And what we found in our study, unfortunately, it's a small N, because the girls in Ohio and New York don't eat a lot of soy. So we mostly are our, our, our Bay Area girls, and in that population, even it was only half of our population that ate a lot of soy. Most of the marine girls and the San Francisco girls. So it's hard to know how significant it is, but it looks like, in our study, that the girls who reported a higher soy intake had a slightly delayed onset of puberty. So I really don't think we can say that soy is causing this. It's, it may or may not prevent it. It certainly is not associated with earlier puberty. There's a lot of other studies that came out um, that have been published out of our, the BSERP. And again, the BSERP was this consortium that I talked about that when I presented that slide with the map. Mary Wolf, one of our colleagues in New York, um, looked at phthalates. And what was kind of concerning is that when she looked at phthalates, she was testing the chemicals in the urine at baseline, at age six to eight, and then measuring them over time. Some phthalates were associated with delayed pubic, pubic hair, but not breast development, and some had the opposite effect. And of the phenols that were tested, four of them had action, but some of them delayed puberty, and some of them accelerated puberty. So remember I said EDCs can act in mysterious ways, and some of these chemicals may not be good, but they may be acting in like, delaying puberty. And that may sound like a good thing, but it's still an, an outside exposure we want to minimize. Our group here at San Francisco looked at the flavor retardants. As I said, we had the highest rate, and other, um, other factors, and we actually found they were associated with delayed breast development. You've probably never heard of these studies. You know, these studies don't get press. This is sort of a negative study, right? Nobody talks about, oh, great, let's get cross flame retardants because it delays the breast development. So yeah, it's complex. Um, an interesting paper that came out of um, our site and New York site as well was that asthma and allergies were associated with younger pubic hair development, but not breast development. And you may say, why were we studying asthma and allergies? Well, in New York City specifically, when you're looking at a built environment that's very polluted and dusty and has a lot of baby cockroaches and other allergens, asthma and allergies may be a proxy for other sort of dirty air or dirty environment. So it's kind of interesting. There'll be more papers coming out. We are by no means done publishing. But it's not clear. It's not like we can point to BPA and say, that's the problem. Let's get rid of it all. So I think the issue with the chemical exposures is there are a few long-term studies with good puberty measures, and we are one of them, but we started late. So we started at age six to eight, but a window of susceptibility that needs to be studied is babies in utero and babies in the first year of life. And we probably need to study what the mothers were exposed to. And that's partly what the Chamaco study that I talked about in Salinas is doing, because they recruited moms when they were pregnant, and they were able to study their pregnancy exposures. Um, we also don't know much about the synergistic effects of these chemicals. So we don't know, okay, BPA delays and flame retardants cause earlier or the other way around, what if you put them together? And then if you add cotiny on top. And a really important thing is, how does stress potentiate these chemical effects? So what the third culprit in the early puberty epidemic, in, after obesity and chemical exposures, is psychosocial factors. And this is something that has been really understudied, but it's been a focus of Julie Deardorff, my colleague, who I've done a lot of research with the book with. And it's really been an interesting focus for her 
And I always say when we talk about stress, people look at me and like, I yelled at my kid this morning because she couldn't find her shoes. That's not the kind of toxic stress we're talking about. When we talk about toxic stress, and there'll be other talks about this today, we're talking about true toxic stress where kids are growing up with neighborhood violence, maybe in violence in their home, they may be witnessing violence on the streets, um, they may be really suffering from quite a lot of socioeconomic and social uh, deprivation that um, other kids are not suffering from. But if we go beyond toxic stress just to various psychosocial factors, there's a whole list that we have studied and published, and this research was not well known in the endocrine or the hormonal or the pediatric community. So we know that exposure is when we go back and look at breastfeeding. If you need one more thing to know that breastfeeding is good, I think we've beaten that dead horse, we all know it's better. What we need to do is help women who can't breastfeed and encourage them in a supportive way. But I will tell you, our data shows that breastfeeding is protective against early puberty in a dose-dependent fashion. So breastfeeding or not, and the longer breastfeeding, all of that is associated with later onset of puberty in girls. And I think that's great. To me, that goes to policy and also just not being judgy about people who really can't breastfeed, and maybe we need to think about ways to really help all women who are working. And you know, when I went back to work, this is where I get on my soapbox. <laughs> when I went back to work, I had my office, I shut the door, I pumped, okay? The janitor who cleans my office in the evening could not do that. So who's gonna breastfeed her kid for 18 months, and who's gonna wean it four months? Right, okay, I'll get off my soapbox. Um, so we now know, as I said before, that maternal pre-pregnancy obesity and pregnancy weight gain is a risk for obesity, it's also a risk, a risk for early onset of breast development and puberty development. So those are psychosocial factors in a way. They're sort of non-truly biologic, but they really affect early puberty. Um, but the other psychosocial aspects are really interesting, and Julie Deerdorf has done a lot of research and published on this. Father absence is a really interesting kind of hot button one. It's really clear that girls who grow up without their biological father in their house at a much higher risk of early onset of first periods of puberty. And so the study has not been about first periods. Our data showed that it was also looking at onset of breast development. And it's an interesting sort of idea to think about how that's mediated. We think it may be through the brain perception, pheromones, and the brain may be thinking it needs to get to reproduction early because it may be perceived as a low grade chronic stress. Sexual abuse is a risk. Child sexual abuse is a risk factor for early puberty. Marsha Herman Giddens, who was the first author on the PROSE study, she actually is not an endocrinologist. She was a sex abuse researcher. And she was noticing that the girls she was seeing had early puberty. And she worked with her local endocrinologist. They thought the girls had early puberty and that's why they were sexually abused. But when they started looking over time, it's, it doesn't work that way. Girls and boys who are abused, specifically, specifically the girls, go through puberty earlier after the abuse. Um, and we do know that, unfortunately, girls who don't have a father in their home are at a slightly higher risk of sexual abuse. You can see how these are all combining now. Family dysfunction and conflict I addressed before, these are kids who are victims of domestic violence or are witnessing domestic violence in their home. Those kids are at a higher risk of early puberty onset. When you look at the psychological data of poor maternal and infant attachment, that's also a risk. But even when you control for all these factors, simply being, <coughs> excuse me, of low socioeconomic status is and these all combine, right? So how do we separate these out? I don't think we can, and I don't think we need to, because we need to start looking at social infrastructure in general. I'm gonna get on my soapbox again, can you tell? So um, one of the questions is, why are all these psychological factors then putting girls at risk? Do you remember that slide I showed about the consequences? Why are girls having a higher risk of depression, early sexual uh, relationships? Part of it may be that they're already being exposed to that, but there's also a biologic cause. And the biologic cause is that your brain is not fully developed till you're in your mid-20s. And you know who knows this? And you knew this a long time ago? The car rental companies. You know how old you have to be to rent a car? <laughs> 26. This is a 26-year-old. Okay. So when we look through, if we look here at the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, or your frontal lobes, those are the ones that are responsible for executive functioning. And you can see these here, we lost the underneath here, sorry, it should say, oh no, up here. This is a five-year-old, this is a preteen. Can you see the red? It's still poorly developed. The teen brain, there's a lot of maturity going on, except this is still immature. And even in a 20-year-old brain, which is almost fully myelinated and mature, this prefrontal cortex, this dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is still not mature. So what does that mean? 
Well, it's interesting if you look at this another way. Here, we look at the maturation of a part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, and this again is the prefrontal cortex. Age-wise, this is adolescence. What's happening here is that the emotion network, or the limbic range, is mature before the prefrontal cortex. So this is related to an in a lack of inhibition and control. So you can't regulate your emotions. So this is heightened in girls that mature earlier than their peers. So it, physically, that those sex hormones are maturing their nucleus accumbens even earlier, but their prefrontal cortex is not maturing earlier. So they have a longer time period where they've got this lag between what I want to do and what I want to do, and oh, it's cool, and oh no, I shouldn't do that. And they have less of the oh no, I shouldn't do that, so their parents need to be, or their teachers, or we, need to be there, oh no, I shouldn't do that, the executive functioning. And if you're growing up already, you've got early puberty for various reasons, and you're growing up in a household where you don't have someone who's able to be your executive functioning skills, you can see that this can lead to poorer outcomes. So it's a synergy of exposures. So you've got the obesity. This is actually a growth chart of a patient of mine. I cut out all the HIPAA. This is a kid who was obese by age. It's a boy. I could have picked a girl, but I shouldn't have picked a girl. Sorry, it's a boy. But this is the uh, BMI, and it doesn't even show up on our growth curve by the time the kid is 10. Plus the toxic chemicals, which may be doing God knows what in combination. Plus, for some of our kids, toxic stress. And what does that lead to? You have a mix of this, and together, it's magnified. So this times this times this equals this to the nth power. So, uh, color doesn't work great here, but I'm gonna walk you through this. I think this group here really understands that health and puberty are mediated by many, many factors. And this is a slide of Julie's that I've borrowed because this is something some of you at PhD students may have seen. Here you have genes, and the sort of old idea that genetics loads the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. Well, look how big the trigger is. Because within that genetic environment the child is born with, they have the nutrition they're provided with. They have the neurobiology they, of their brain development. They have general health, and that's them. This is the greed, this is their genes, this is their body. And then you have their immediate environment, their home environment, their enrichment. Are they plunked in front of the TV? Are they plunked in daycare? Are they talked to? There's many daycares that have a much richer environment than if kids who are deprived of that, but that can be very variable. You may have very poor housing quality. You may be exposed to your neighbor's cigarette smoke, even if your mom doesn't and dad don't smoke. You may be exposed to pesticides, and then the family relationships. And then when we get out here, we're looking at the larger environment. So you can think about this is the kid's genes, this is the kid, this is their house, this is their neighborhood. And what's going on in their neighborhood? Is there violence? Is there discrimination? Is there poverty? Are they dealing with acculturation issues? So when we look at this, we think, you know, double jeopardy? This is actually kind of triple jeopardy. All of these are combining, and people in this room are part of the solution. And I think all is not lost, because I think many groups are trying to change this, so we see girls on the run over there. My daughters and girls on the run, love girls on the run. I see, we see many boys and girls, but we see many organizations that are working to, okay, so we can't necessarily change the genes, and maybe we can't change that kid's house, but everybody in this room can change that environment and that neighborhood. And I think this group of preaching to the choir, you wouldn't be here if you didn't want to do that. But I think social justice is a huge issue, and I started off as a researcher and a clinician, and I got this voice of the New York Times op-ed as an example, like, okay, I'm gonna say what I really think now. I've been saying what I'm supposed to say for years, and I've done that, I'm gonna say what I really think. And I think that pubertal timing is a barometer for the environment. We were gonna call the book The Canary in the Coal Mine, but our editor said that wouldn't be published. <laughs> we called it The New Puberty Instead. But pubertal timing, I think the fact that these girls are going through puberty early is a real warning sign for us. That we know that biological processes are highly influenced by external factors, and many factors intersect to create these poor health. And we really have to think of this as a social justice issue, and our, our most vulnerable communities are being the, one, the ones that are overly subjected to these exposures. So here's an example. Think about the part of the city where the shipping used to be in the war in San Francisco where all the chemicals are still in the water. That's Hunter's Point. Historically, who has lived in Hunter's Point? Historically, it's been a very African-American community. So when we talk about African-American girls who are already going through puberty early in 1997 in San Francisco, is that because they were living on top of a pesticide dump or not pesticide, but these chemicals? I don't know. But that's an example of our vulnerable community living in a place 
that was really uh, already kind of putting people behind the eight ball. And that's what I mean by I don't think it's genetic. I don't think you can look at these differences between African American, Hispanic, Asian and white girls and say it's genetic. I think you have to step back and say, what other exposures are these girls being exposed to differentially that's actually leading to those um, levels that are different? So, the new days. Remember I presented the old days? If what I learned in med school was wrong, this is now what I'm teaching. I may be wrong too, but for now I'm right. I'll see in the future. Any pubertal development before age six to seven is abnormal. We still think periods should start before age 10. And in boys, I haven't even talked about boys. Boys is a whole different topic because they have totally different hormones. We think age nine is still the cutoff and there's more research going on in them. Puberty may have a paradoxical effect and it may delay puberty in boys, but that's a whole other topic for my topic today. So uh, in general, puberty is starting earlier. We think first periods are starting a couple months earlier and we think that obesity is a driving factor, but it does not explain all the variants. Okay, no, my last slide lost. Does someone help me? That was not the end of it. Did I turn it off? Did it say? No. It says zero. Did I go over time? <laughs> I don't really get some idea. Okay, so what I was going to say was we live in a toxic suit of chemicals. And so obviously it's really hard to isolate any particular one. And is this showing? Oh, there we go. So, um, Obesity, chemicals, and toxic stress are all contributing, but it's hard to isolate any particular one. I really want to thank the girls, and I don't know if there's any Signets in the audience here, but Signet was the name of a local group that was recruited out of Kaiser, and we called it Signet because we had a breast cancer survivorship study that was called the SWAN study. And this was breast cancer prediction and puberty prediction. And these girls now are going off to college, and I'm starting to run into them in like random places, like it talks, and someone comes up and says, I was in Signet. And we could not have done the study. There were 444 girls at Kaiser and another 800 across the country that came in every year for 10 years and had a physical exam determining their puberty. And if you could think about what that would be like as a 12 year old girl, I want you to think that internally. <laughs> and then lastly, I wanted to go over some resources. Um, so in general, Julie and I wrote the book, The New Puberty, because we were being asked to speak so much at Girl Scout troops and school and um, we couldn't talk to everybody who felt needed this information, and so we wrote this book to explain kind of what the causes of puberty are. Julie wrote, the second half of the book is what Julie wrote about how to help parents and teachers mediate these things, and it's not a direct line from early puberty to losing your virginity at 13, and how you can, I'm exaggerating, but how you can really mediate. Um, so I think for any families that you think could benefit from reading a book if their daughters are going through puberty early, I'm, I'm proud of it. Uh, you know, it's not perfect, but I'm, we're, we think it's a good resource. Other resources are um, the EWG app. This is a brand new logo, Environmental Working Group. If you don't have it, get it on your phone, get it now. I think there's Wi-Fi. It's an amazing database. They don't take any money from any chemical companies, cosmetic companies. The database um, is really for cleaning supplies, cosmetics, makeup. I am that person in CVS scanning things. What's the EWG score? Okay. Um, I went through and went through my you know, cleaning supplies at home, and I had like my laptop and my iPad with the online, that I could shop online and I could get all the scores. And when you're ready to buy new cleaning supplies, I just encourage you to look them up. Don't necessarily throw away the ones you got. You might as well use them because they're, you know, they're already there. But when you buy new chemical stuff or cleaning stuff or makeup, I, can, I really encourage you to look at their chemical makeup. And I don't know that much about chemicals. Even the people I know who are environmental researchers use the EWG website because they have the chemical scientists. The other one that kids like, the girls like, is called Think Dirty. I think they like it because of the name. And Think Dirty is another one with makeup in it. And so if you have daughters or you work with teenage girls, really encourage them to think twice about their cosmetics. And I think this generation of girls can be really um, very powerful in making a change. A lot of you probably heard about a month ago, there was a big paper that came out and got a lot of press and was on NPR about girls in a, a study who were given clean makeup and then their chemical levels all dropped. I don't know if any of you heard that study. Kim Harley did it um, out of Berkeley, really wonderful research. That was out of Chamacos, that group in Salinas. She took those girls and had a cohort of teenage girls and they went into a room and went shopping for free and bought all clean cosmetics from all the companies that make really healthier cosmetics and they measured their levels of, of chemicals and they all went down. Now again, we don't know what those chemicals are necessarily doing, but I think it's probably better not to have them in your body. So these two resources are really great. EWG also puts out a Dirty Dozen and Clean 15 for food. This is last year's one. They just put a new one out on Wednesday. 
So look it up. Uh, this year, strawberries are the top of the dirty dozen. Last year, it was apples. So every year it changes because the, the farming technology is changing and they're using different chemicals. So you need to keep up on this. Um, and for patients who are really worried, or for families that are really worried about buying organic, I usually say it depends on your means. Organic is more expensive. If you can buy fruits and vegetables, just start there. If you have enough money to choose some of your veg fruits and vegetables to be organic, buy the dirty dozen organic and don't worry about the clean fifteen. If you have unlimited resources or you just want to spend your money this way, then buy organic. And the reason for that is that you are voting with your wallet and you are sending a message saying that we should have more organic. And it doesn't have to be at whole paycheck, whole foods. It can be at Costco. Costco is doing a lot of organic now. Why is Costco doing organic? Because people who shop at Costco ask for it. And Costco is a huge supplier, and I'm not necessarily a proponent of any one store or the other, but there's a group of people who can shop at some stores and some who can't. And if we get organically available produce available, we're helping more people. Salima is producing something like 80% of the country's um, green greenery salads. And only something like, I'm going to get this wrong, so don't quote me on this, I think 3% of it is grown organically. And those are the, ch the children of that 97% are the ones that we're studying in Chinampas. So what I say to my kids is I buy organic, it may or may not help you, but I know it's helping kids who live in Salinas because their parents aren't being exposed to it. And their school isn't being sprayed because their school's in the middle of this field. So again, soapbox here, but I think if you can afford to buy organic, please do. If you can't, or your families can't, focus on the dirty dozen or just eat more fruits and vegetables. And lastly, for those people who work with girls who are early bloomers or just going through puberty, the American Girl um, books are very good. There's many, many books on available about puberty. But what I like about the American Girl books is they broke it down into two stages, younger girls and older girls. So there's a book about puberty for really young girls. And a lot of the books about puberty talk about sex and anorexia. And the old American Girl book used to do that. But they split it in two. And the number two book is for older girls. The number one book has like stick figure of a girl developing breasts, and it talks about brushing your teeth and lice. It's appropriate for a six-year-old to be reading with her parents. So I encourage parents of young girls who are going through puberty to get this book out of the library or buy it. And sometimes I actually suggest buying it because the girls thumb through it for years. And the parent can read it to them or a school counselor or a teacher, and then later the girls read it themselves. And they may not tell you they're reading it, but they are still. That's a really good resource. American Girl, you know, you have your issues with their expensive dolls, but their books are really good. So, <laughs> so uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have time for two questions. Sorry. <laughs> um, so if you just raise your hand, that will bring you a mic. I said I was going to go short, and I went long. Um, did you notice any uh, correlation with the age of parents as well, getting older with the child that they had? So, no, we had, we did not see a difference. Part of the problem with that is um, we looked at three different sites. Some of the exposures are different at different sites. The girls in New York are significantly younger mothers, but there were so many other factors they were exposed to we could not isolate that. Girl, the girls in San Francisco tended to have older parents. So it was hard to analyze that because we didn't have enough the uh, exposures are too varied within those groups as well. Good question. Oh, there's one back there. Oh. Wait, wait, wait for my. Can you speak to the significance of the time period between pubertal when it, the, the development starts and when the period occurs. That period is spreading. Yes, I'm that is. Thank you very much. I know her. I think she's a plant. That's a really good point, and I should have made sure she should clarify that. Thanks, Julie. So I talked about puberty as a window of susceptibility, because there's a lot of cellular processes that are, that are rapidly changing and dividing. If you get your breast development at age 11, and you get your period at 13, you have two years of that. If you start breast development at 7, and you get your period at age 12, your period started earlier, but you just had five years of that, tenth, of that period of susceptibility. So one of our concerns is that as puberty is getting earlier, we don't think periods or menarche are getting that much earlier. You've just lengthened puberty, and you've just increased the window of susceptibility, 
at a time in human development when there's a lot more bad exposures that can be happening during that time. So that's a concern for the later consequences down the line. Well, please join me in thanking Dr. Greenspan again.